Hello and thank you for learning with me. Today we are studying Psalm number 55 out of this book and there is so much ground to cover. I'm going to try and be really fast to get through all this information because time is the most precious commodity that we have and wasting time is like stealing from somebody and I definitely don't want to do that. So this Psalm talks about David who is fleeing from his son of Shalom. So similar to King Saul who was the first king of Israel over 3,000 years ago, um, King Saul wanted to usurp David's power and to overthrow him because instead of his son being his successor, it ended up being his son-in-law who was his successor, King David. And King Saul didn't like that um, because the people had anointed King David to be their king instead of it going directly to King Saul's son who the people didn't believe deserved the kingship and that aggravated King Saul. So not only did David's father-in-law try to usurp his power and kill him but so did his son and his son wanted to usurp his kingship and kill him because he didn't believe that he deserved to be king anymore because of his sins. So David had enemies not only um, with other nations but even within his own family which is very unfortunate and sad. Um, this psalm, I'm going to jump into um, verse 7. It said, um, If only I could fly and rest as I fly. So the actual verse is, Vayomer, and he said, Mi tendli ever keyona, who will give me. Um, uh, organs like a dove. Aufa, I will fly veash kona, and I will rest as I fly. So it's translated is. So there, this is very important because, as I mentioned in the previous video, there could be so many different translations because every word is so loaded and yada yada. It says in the translation, and I said, if only I had wings like a dove, whereas where it's, it says in Hebrew, me iten li, who will give me wings like a dove? So it's important to note here that there's the literal translation, which is the actual words, and then there's the figurative translation, which is what do the words actually mean? Meaning what is the intent of the author to express? So it, like in, in uh, chapter 54, where I said that I disagreed with the translation, it's because I was translating it at face value, the literal translation, whereas some translators trans translate the figurative translation, what, what they think that the author meant. So it can be very deep and complex. There's many different levels. And indeed, our sages tell us that there are 70 faces to the scriptures, the Torah, um, because of all of these different possible interpretations and meanings. And indeed, the Talmud it consists of debates between the sages, holy rabbis. The, uh, they were on a saintly level, very, very, very high level of intellect. They, in order to sit on Sanhedrin and be a judge, for example, people had to speak 70 languages fluently. They had a level of intellect that we cannot even fathom in this day and age. And so the Talmud consists of debates on all of the laws and scriptures between these sages who had a very, very, very high level of intellect. So there is no real agreement or, you know, unified voice about like what things say only on what we determine to um, go by. So there we go. So again, now in verse 8, we have the word hine, and it means behold, whereas in chapter 54, they had the word hallo, and they translated it into behold. So you cannot take word for word and interchange the translation because the translation and the meaning depends on the context. And so it's so complicated and yet so beautiful at the same time. I want to point out that it says here um, in verse 8 that uh, better that I lodge in the wilderness of the land of Israel. Again, this is 3,000 years ago. The land of Israel. It does not say Palestine because Palestine did not exist 3,000 years ago. Um, in fact, it's just a name that was assigned to the region. Um, 
than in palaces outside the Holy Land. So the Holy Land in Scripture, in the Bible, in the Psalms was always called Israel and nothing else. But before it was Israel, it was known as Canaan. And that's it. All right. So let's move on. Uh, let's jump to actually, oops, I, I skipped something very interesting. Psalm um, it, verse 10, Ki ra'iti Hamas v'riv ba'ir. So we see the word Hamas again in the Hebrew uh, Psalms, uh, chapter 55, verse 10. And it's translated as, for I have seen violence. So again, Hamas, depending on the context, can mean violence, corruption, venom, so many bad words, okay? And strife in the city. So, and then in the same chapter as Hamas, flipping the page, in verse 22, we have, um, oh, sorry, verse 20, we have the word Yishmael. Yishmael means may God hear, but Yishmael, the character, the person in the Bible, is the son of Abraham and Hagar and the father of all of the 1.8 billion, with a B, Muslims in the world. So the words Hamas and Ishmael in the same verse, and then, or sorry, in the same chapter in different verses, and then in verse 22, um, God says to David, do not fear Everyone may be with him, i.e. your enemy, Hamas Ishmael, but I am with you. So even though the vile Hamas commits atrocious crimes against humanity, vile behavior that should not even be repeated what they have done, um, the UN does not impose sanctions on Hamas. The entire world is doing uh, pro-Palestinian um, demonstrations that have been getting out of hand and more and more acts of terrorism and violence in Europe and America and the border of Canada, etc. So uh, God is saying, do not fear. Everyone may be with the enemy, but I am with you. So that's reassuring, thank you, God. <laughs> um, then later on, it says in verse 23 that cast your burdens upon God and he will sustain you. Um, so God welcomes us whenever we call on God. So we should always call to God and he welcomes our prayers. Verse 24, um, oh, it talks about how King David says, bloodthirsty and treacherous men, who therefore shall not live out half of their days. And in this Psalm, he's talking about Ahitophel was somebody who was supposed to be David's friend, somebody who was very close to him, close to his heart, his you know companion and, and somebody who he studied with and considered like family. So he actually betrayed David and was kind of like, Doeg and Achitofel both wanted to kill David, and so much so that Achitofel told Avshalom, David's son, you know, don't kill your your dad, I got this, you know, like. So they actually, in those days, it was normal for people to live 70 years, that was an average lifespan. So they actually died at ages 34 and, and 30, let's see, uh, uh, 34 and 33 years, which is less than half of the lifespan, which is what David said. So when a prophet when a prophet speaks, God listens. The battle of prayer. So also in um, in verse where we are 24. Oh no, sorry. This is from verse. Mm -mm. There's a verse that talks about prayer three times a day, and I will find it. Uh, mm -mm. Sorry. <laughs> uh. All right, found it. It's verse 18. It says, evening, morning, and noon, I will speak of my troubles and moan, and he will hear my voice. So these are alluding to the three times a day that um, Jewish men pray. And prayer is um, compared in the Zohar, which is the Jewish Kabbalistic and mystical writings, to battle. So the battlefield is the mind, the heart, and the body of the worshiper, the person praying. 
the combatants are the altruistic godly soul versus the egocentric animal soul. As with physical battle, the spiritual battle of prayer also requires close combat with the enemy. Indeed, the word for battle, krav, also connotes closeness, karov, since in order to battle and vanquish an enemy, one cannot battle from afar, but must engage closely with it. You may have heard of Israeli self-defense. It's called Krav Maga. It's a battle. It's a battle and you have to actually obviously be close to your opponent. You know, otherwise, you can't hit him or her or defend yourself. So prayer is likened to battling. Um, so we're battling our own nature. So sometimes we know right from wrong, but it's sometimes it's hard to do the right thing. So in prayer, we're asking for God's help. And like I said before, God welcomes us whenever we call on him. Um, and ah, yes, the last two concepts that I want to end with is that um, in verse 18, it says, I will speak and he will hear my voice. Asicha veishma koli. So it's talking about the words um, sicha, meaning prayer. So sicha is a conversation, it's communication. So prayer is us communicating and having a relationship with the divine. So during prayer, we are asking God to move, as it were, from his essential remoteness, being in the heavens, etc., to descend and desire to bless us with sustenance, etc., so we're asking God, basically, um, you know, to come down here and, and help us with whatever it is that we need. All right. And the last thing is that, um, well, second to last, the universe was born into a state of spiritual darkness so that we can then transform that darkness into the light of day. And we do that with prayer. So that's our job. We need to um, transform the darkness into the light and bring heaven down to earth, bring godliness into our reality. And the last thing that I, I wanted to tie in uh, back again in, in verse 24, it says, um, blood thirsty and treacherous men. And it says, anshe damim u merima. Merima is deceit. So I just thought it was interesting that in this uh, chapter 55 of Psalms, we have Yishmael, the father of all the Muslim people, Hamas, the terrorist organization, and bloodthirsty and treacherous men. So all of these things kind of go together. They were applicable 3,000 years ago. They're applicable today. And um, I do want to end, though, on a positive note about the importance of prayer and how we should always talk to God as if we were talking to our best friend and um, be open to, to receive God's blessings. Thank you so much for watching. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye.